today I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the basics of electrodiagnostic evaluation. Um, the, the reason I picked this topic is because um, when I've worked with a few, few of you guys, me and the residents in clinic, and we end up trying to go over, you know, nerve conduction studies and uh, the results of electro electromyography. And it's always just pretty difficult uh, because if you don't see it often, then it's hard to kind of go through um, how to interpret what in these um, uh, neurologists, you know, who specialize in electrophysiology are telling us basically. And as you kind of get further and further into the weeds, you find out that these studies are really, really subjective. And it's good to kind of have just a basic bearing on, um, on what they're looking at, how they're looking at it, and then what it means to interpret it. And so this is not meant to be exhaustive because it would take a really long time. Um, you know, the texts on uh, EMG nerve connection study are hundreds of pages long. Um, and it also gets really complicated and kind of boring. So I'm going to just kind of go over some of the, the basics here and hopefully this will this will be useful. Um, so starting out, uh, when we talk about electrodiagnostics, um, a lot of times we say, you know, we say we're going to get somebody an EMG. Um, but what we mean by that really is we're going to get, you know, a nerve conduction study. We're going to, to have them look at um, the muscles specifically and that's electromyography. And then a lot of times they'll do some special studies along with that. So they'll check in the H reflex, they'll look at the F waves, and depending on what exactly you're looking for, they might do a few other special studies too. Um, but for our purposes today, we're just gonna look at nerve conduction studies and electromyography. Um, because when you send someone for, um, you know, electrodiagnostic evaluation, uh, typically, we're trying to figure out, hey, is this an issue um, with the nerve roots? Is it an issue with a plexus? Is it an issue with the peripheral nerve? And so we're going to look at it kind of from that, that viewpoint. So as I, as I mentioned before, you know, a lot of times when we use, when we send someone for an EMG or a, an NCS, we're looking to try to differentiate at what level the problem with the, um, the nerve is. And so kind of when we've had lectures like this before, we've said, hey, is it, a, is it a spinal cord problem? Is it a root problem? Is it a problem at the plexus? Uh, or is it a problem at one of the, the peripheral nerves? Um, and so these studies kind of help us localize where the lesion is. And this becomes really important when you're trying to decide, hey, is it a problem at the dorsal root ganglion uh, before or after? Uh, is it a problem at the anterior horn cell? or is there a problem before that? So uh, these studies can be useful in that regard. Um, but it can also be used to help with diagnosis of other um, neurological problems as well. So uh, looking at myopathies um, or hereditary uh, demyelinating disorders, acquired demyelinating disorders, um, helps with the diagnosis of things like motor neuron disease. And so differentiating um, a neurosurgical problem from a neuro neurological problem also. Uh, these are useful for that. Starting out, you know, we're talking about a nerve conduction study. All right, so this is not the EMG. This is just a nerve conduction study. Um, in general, there's three different kinds. And so there's um, evaluation of sensory nerves, evaluation of motor nerves, and evaluation of mixed nerves. All right. And when I say evaluation of a sensory nerve or a motor nerve, it doesn't mean that it has to be pure motor or pure sensory necessarily. But what they're doing is they're looking at the conduction of these um, of the axons that are um, meeting that type of information. So you can do a sensory study of the median nerve. You can do a motor study of the median nerve, uh, even though it's a mixed nerve that carries multiple uh, types of fibers. So today we'll talk about sensory and motor. We're not going to talk about mixed. Um, now, importantly, when you do one of these studies, it's not evaluating all the nerve fibers in the bundle. All right. So if you have done a you know carpal tunnel release with me, you see the median nerve is huge. It's not looking at every nerve fiber there. It's looking at the most heavily myelinated nerve fibers. And so why that's important is that thinly myelinated uh, and unmyelinated axons are not assessed. And so the fibers that carry pain, 
um, carry some sensation and temperature. These may not be represented in the uh, nerve conduction study. Uh, and so what I mean by that is that if this someone has a small fiber neuropathy um, or has um, maybe pain due to nerve compression, maybe an early carpal tunnel or something like this, it may not be seen on an EMG. I mean, I'm sorry, on a nerve conduction study. Um, it may show up as normal. And that's because, again, when we're testing the nerve, we're looking at the heavily myelinated axons, not all types of axons. This is a diagram. When, when I was putting together this talk, um, this, is kind of, this, is a, this is a newer talk. When I was putting it together and reviewing kind of the literature on this, I felt like all the diagrams are kind of hard to understand. And this may still be hard to understand, but I'm gonna give it a give it a go here. And so what I wanted you to look at on this graze plate is the median nerve. All right. And so the median nerve is here at the wrist, of course, ulnar nerves on the other side. And then the median nerve comes down, it gives off the recurrent branch that goes to the thenar eminence, and then it divides into a common and proper uh, digital branches. <clears throat> so if we're just using the median nerve as an example, um, and this is going to be how the uh, sensory nerve conduction study is done. Now, you can stimulate proximal to distal or distal to proximal. I'm not going to get into any of that today. The point here is that where the you know the red circle and black circle are, these are the, this is the cathode and the anode, and this is where the depolarization of the nerve happens. So we're stimulating the sensory nerve there, which is the digital nerves. Now, as you stimulate and the nerve, it depolarizes, which carries an action potential proximally and distally, but we're just going to measure across the wrist because we're going to be mostly interested in whether or not there's a block in the conduction um, or a, um, a change in the rate of conduction across a specific area. And in this case, it's the carpal tunnel. So we stimulate at the finger, we record um, just proximal to the carpal tunnel. Uh, so those blue circles, those are the reference um, are the recording electrodes and there's an active electrode there's a reference electrode um, that's for some compute uh, complicated computer stuff that we don't need to get into and then the green circle is just the the ground you want to stimulate you end up getting this waveform all right so again not going to get too much into how to interpret waveforms but this is giving you a basic idea of what you see so you know the, the first kind of upward deflection is just going to be the stimulus artifact then you have a period of time where it takes the action potential um, uh, time to be recorded. All right, so you stimulate the finger, there's time, and then, then waveform is where you see uh, that's where the action potential is recorded at the recording electrodes. So this is past the wrist. Um, kind of what I, what I want to point out here and the values that we're interested in um, are the onset latency. So that's the time it takes from stimulus to the waveform, all right? So stimulus to uh, the action potential being recorded. And if you know the distance between where you stimulate and you where you record, then you can calculate the conduction velocity. And then the other thing I wanna point out is just the amplitude, all right? So in this case, from the baseline uh, to the peak, all right? There's different types of amplitudes that can be measured, but we're looking at baseline, that's a peak. And this amplitude is um, is the other thing. So we're looking at conduction velocity and amplitude. And we'll kind of go by um, why that's important here as time goes on. This is a motor nerve conduction study. And this is also the median nerve. All right. And so at this point, um, we're stimulating the median nerve proximal to the carpal tunnel. All right. So the, the main median nerve. As we said, the median nerve comes through the carpal tunnel, it gives off the recurrent branch, and that goes to the thenar eminence, all right? And so these recording electrodes are in the blue here are sitting over the abductor pollicis brevis. And that, if you've been in clinic with me, I mean, that's the muscle that a lot of times we test when we're looking at you know, the median innervated hand intrinsics and assessing for carpal tunnel. And um, so you stimulate the nerve, you record at the muscle. Now, 
where they want to record is at the motor point of the muscle or where the nerve is entering into the muscle and it's the most heavily um, saturated with motor end plates. Uh, so you're looking at basically depolarization of those muscle fibers, not contraction, because that's calcium mediated, but depolarization. The, the waveform that you get from this is, um, it looks a little bit different than a sensory nerve action potential. Uh, it's a little bit more round, the peak is a little bit more round. Um, and this is again, looking at uh, the, the, um, uh, the muscle response, not the contraction, but the depolarization of the muscle as the nerve carries an impulse to the motor end plate. <laughs> and so um, now this is gets a little bit into the weeds, but the kind of the point about this, um, this equation is that whereas with a sensory nerve, you're stimulating the nerve, you're recording out the nerve. All right, um, but with a motor nerve, you're stimulating at the nerve, you're recording at the muscle. And so the actual nerve conduction velocity can't be determined from just one reading. You have to do two different readings, two different stimulation sites, so that you can cancel out the amount of time that it takes uh, for that impulse to go through the motor end plate to depolarize the muscle. Um, uh, that's not terribly important except to say that when you see uh, motor nerve conduction studies, you're going to see multiple stimulation sites, and that's why they do that. Again, the things I wanna point out here are the latency. Um, and in this case, you have two different latencies that help you determine the conduction velocity. And then again, the amplitude. And then in this case, also the duration um, of the wave. That's great and everything. Now you know what the waveforms look like, but how do you go about interpreting this? And when I when I first started looking at these, these um, this was always a little bit confusing to me because if you try to look up a normal set of values, it, it's hard to find uh, because what ends up happening it's kind of like lab values, um, you know, in a lab in a hospital. Um, you know, what's a normal white count or what's a normal H and H? Um, it's going to be um, dependent on the electrodiagnostic lab. They have its own set of lab value uh, of normal values. And then also it's going to change dependent on the age. All right, so uh, conduction velocity changes as we get older, uh, changes with body habitus, it changes with a lot of things. Um, so there's not a great reference just to say, hey, you know, it should be conducting at this speed. Now. Fortunately, on a lot of these studies, if you look in the um, report itself, it'll give you a reference and it'll tell you kind of what that lab's normal amplitude says it should be or the, what they say the normal conduction velocity should be. Um, and then ultimately, though, it's really important if there is a complicated case to have the contralateral limb evaluated as well, because this gives you a built in comparison. All right, so you can take a look at, say, the APB on the left compared to the right. And a lot of times the carpal tunnel, especially, uh, they'll do left right comparisons. And that is that can be diagnostic um, of, you know, a compression neuropathy. Now, when we were looking at the waveforms, there were a couple things I wanted to point out. So. One was to look at the latency, which is the time it takes um, for the uh, action potential to travel from the stimulation site to the recording site. All right, and so in this uh, picture on the right hand side, uh, we have two waveforms. The amplitudes are the same, but the latency or the time that it takes for that impulse to reach the recording site is longer. All right, so this horizontal arrow is longer on the bottom side than it is on the top. And so if you put these two right on top of each other, you would just see that one has shifted over to the right. And um, this uh, shows that the conduction velocity, assuming that we've kept the distance the same, the conduction velocity has slowed, and that's why the latency is longer. Um, and the conduction velocity in this case is only going to be looking at the, the fastest fibers. So again, we talked about nerve conduction studies look at myelinated fibers and the sensory nerve action potentials, we're looking at 
the fastest conducting fibers. So it doesn't represent every fiber, but it represents the fastest ones. Um, now, importantly, conduction velocity, latency, they don't tell us anything about the number of fibers that are working. So theoretically, you have two fibers versus 100 fibers. It doesn't matter because we're just looking at the fastest fibers, looking at their um, uh, the propagation of action potential, and it does not reflect how many fibers there are. It only reflects how quickly the signal is being passed along the intact fibers. So latency and conduction velocity, uh, these things have to do with um, how fast the signal is being passed along, not about how many fibers are working in the nerve. So you have an increased latency, same amplitude, that's what we're looking at when it comes to conduction velocity. Now, this is the, again, looking at that motor and nerve um, waveform. And now we're looking at the amplitude. Amplitude is really important because there is a clinical correlate, all right? So there's a, there's a high correlation between a decrease in amplitude and weakness on exam or sensory loss when you're doing a sensory exam. Amplitude reflects the number of functioning fibers in that nerve. It doesn't reflect the, the speed at which um, the impulse is conducted. So if you look at both of these things kind of together, then you say conduction velocity has to do with things like myelination. So if you have a demyelinating lesion, a conduction block, things like this, that changes conduction velocity. But if you have if you have loss of axons, that affects amplitude. So axonal problems, amplitude, conduction problems, myelinating problems. So that's how I separate those out. That's not 100% of the time. And there are things like dispersion that can happen of the conduction block that gets a little bit more into the weeds. But for our purposes today, that's kind of what we're going to, that's how we're going to think about it. Now, what is the, you know, what are the benefits of looking at sensory nerve action potentials? So, so far today, we've, we've looked at sensory nerve action potentials. We looked at compound motor action potentials. Sensory nerve action potentials, we're measure, we're stimulating the nerve and we're measuring at the nerve. All right. Why are they useful? Well, these studies um, help us localize where the lesion is in relationship to the dorsal root ganglion. So the dorsal root ganglion is what has the cell bodies. And if you have a problem before the dorsal root ganglion, those cell bodies are still in continuity with that sensory organ in the hand or leg or wherever. So just to kind of give it give it a good example of this. Um, if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, that is a lesion that is distal to the dorsal root ganglion. If you have a nerve root avulsion, that's proximal, all right? So nerve root avulsion, preganglionic. Um, carpal tunnel or brachial plexopathy, postganglionic. Snaps will be normal with preganglionic lesions. Snaps are abnormal with lesions that are postganglionic or that affect the dorsal root ganglion. They're also more sensitive than CMAPs. So it takes a while to see a change in the muscle. Um, so one of the, the first things that you see change in carpal tunnel syndrome is you start to see a change in the sensory nerve uh, portion of the median nerve. So uh, you see changes in the conduction. Because carpal tunnel syndrome, there's constant compression, there's demyelination, the conduction velocity is slowed. That's what you see first. Now, as time goes on, you can start to see um, axonal loss, and that's where you see the weakness in the hands. You can see um, that the CMAP, CMAP amplitude, which reflects the number of functioning axons, we can see that come down. But the first thing you start to see um, are changes in the snaps.
The problem with SNAPs are that they're very, very um, sensitive to lots of factors. So if you try to, say, measure um, the sural nerve and you know an old person, good luck with that. You're not going to find it. Or if you try to measure superficial peroneal nerve in someone who's obese or has pitting edema, you're not going to be able to find it. So these um, studies are kind of finicky and they're very susceptible to um, to changes, whether it's you know age or body habitus um, or technical factors like the temperature of the limb when you're um, doing the study or where you're recording at. So they're finicky, but they're sensitive um, when looking for early problems. The other issue is that the further away you stimulate from uh, the recording, um, the more of a change in a waveform you can see. Um, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and that is difficult to interpret sometimes. That's called temporal dispersion, and that's why sensory nerves, you have to do smaller segments when you study them. Uh, CMAPs, the, the longer segments um, can be studied. All right, so you don't see a change in the amplitude um, just because you're stimulating further away. And they're less uh, likely to be affected by body habitus, um, things like that. And they're useful in that they help you to uh, determine between a pure um, motor issue, like a myopathy, um, or an odor, upper motor neuron issue, like motor neuron disease, um, from um, other issues that are could involve both sensory and <laughs> muscle by components. So putting this together in a very kind of in a very crude way, this is kind of um, how I think about it here. So if you have somebody with a motor and a sensory problem and the sensory nerve study is normal, but the C-map is abnormal, then that tells me that the injury has got to be preganglionic on the sensory portion of the nerve and distal to the anterior horn cell or the you know the cell body the lower motor neuron with the CMAP. So where can you see that? Well, you can see that with a nerve root avulsion, or you can see that if there's compression of one of the spinal roots, uh, the uh, nerve roots in the spinal canal. Um, but it has to be has to be a proximal compression. Um, but what if you have someone who comes in with both motor and sensory deficits again? Now find that the snap is abnormal. Well, it says there has to be a problem along the sensory portion of the nerve distal to the uh, ganglion or at the ganglion. So how can you get both disruption of fibers distal to the ganglion? Um, and distal to the anterior horn cell uh, because the C-maps are normal. Well, that's really just the entirety of the nerve, right? That's the whole peripheral nerve, and that can be within a plexus or that can be um, after it comes out of the plexus. But what if you have somebody who has only motor deficits with intact sensation, and then you have a normal snap and an abnormal C-map? So on exam, no sensory problem. On Nerve conduction, no sensory problem. Well, this is kind of, I guess, a little bit um, ridiculous, but and it's pretty obvious, but this is a pure motor problem, all right? And so um, this may be from like, you know, pure motor um, disorder or a myopathy or something like that. So that's that's the nerve conduction study portion of the electrodiagnostic evaluation. Briefly, I want to go over electromyography and what this is, is uh, the, the practitioner, the, the neurologist or the PNR doc, is going to take a, a needle um, and it's going to put it into the muscle. And it's going, they're going to evaluate the response in different phases. So there's this insertion phase, there's a rest phase, and there's an activation phase. And then they're going to look out at a re they're going to look at a readout on the screen and look at waveforms and interpret what they see. But they're also going to listen to what they hear, uh, which is the uh, firing of motor unit action potentials. Right. This is only to look at. This is looking at muscles. So this is gives you information about motor neurons, or about 
um, intrinsic muscle disorders. All right, so this is not telling us information about the sensory nerves. When you, during the insertion phase, put a needle into the muscle. And then what they do is they redirect this needle multiple times within the muscle in different directions. And every time they put the needle in, it causes some um, excitability in the muscle. So it causes mechanical disruption uh, and depolarization of the muscle. And so you put the needle in, you move it around, and then they see waveforms come up on the screen. And this is termed insertional activity. Now, you can imagine that if in the muscle you're testing, if that's filled with fat or fibrotic tissue, then you're not going to see as much response from the muscle. So you see decreased insertional activity. Um, now, uh, in contrast, you know, on the other side of that, if you have a muscle that is really irritable, that is very sensitive, um, perhaps one that's been denervated uh, or damaged, then you can have increased insertional, uh, increased insertional activity. When you put the muscle, when you put the needle in, you move it around, the muscle is going crazy. And one of the things you can see um, is positive sharp waves. I'm not going to get into what those look like or sound like because that's beyond this. But if you see positive sharp waves, then that might clue you into uh, the fact that there's been denervation to that muscle. So there's been damage to the nerve that goes to that muscle. All right. Now, if you kind of think back to boards, there's also something called fibrillation potentials. Positive sharp waves and fibrillations, those go along with denervation. Um, positive sharp waves, though, can be seen a little bit earlier in the fibrillations. Uh, next thing is the, the rest phase, and this is the period of time between <clears throat> advancing the electrode in the muscle. And so it's kind of this um, time where the needle is not moving and then looking for spontaneous activity. So you're not causing the muscle to respond. You're just looking for um, activity to happen without any type of instigation. There's a lot of things you can see. The things that we look for are fibrillation potentials. And this is spontaneous depolarization of the muscle fibers and it reflects motor axon loss, right? Kind of like uh, positive sharp waves, um, fibrillations clues into uh, the fact that there's been loss of axons from denervation. But it takes a while to appear, and this is why you don't get an EMG, you know, right after um, an injury, because it's just not going to show. It takes three weeks or so. Um, and the nice thing about this is it tells us how long it's been going on sometimes, tells us how severe it can be, uh, and tells us the distribution of the denervation. And so and it's useful in that regard. And then also it's it's very, um, EMG in general is very sensitive uh, to motor axon loss. You know, you can see, you know, usually it's, it's put out as one plus, two plus, three plus fibrillations. And so even with a, with a mild amount of axonal loss, you can see one plus or, you know, pretty um, um, mild changes on this rest phase. And then the last phase here is the uh, activation phase. And basically what that means is that, say you put a needle into the biceps, you say, I want you to flex your arm. And so the needles in the arm, then you're having them flex. And as they add more and more and more um, effort, then what you see is you see more and more and more firing of these motor unit action potentials. So it starts off with kind of these discrete um, waves and then the, the frequency and the amplitude increase, or, or I'm sorry, the frequency and the number of um, motor units um, increase. And so if you look at the bottom of the screen here, this is called the interference pattern. And what I'm pointing out is that in a normal person, when they're giving full, um, full effort, it'll start off sm slow, uh, small, and it'll get faster and bigger and more uh, depolarization. And so it's just one big mess on the screen. And that's a normal interference pattern. That's normal recruitment. That's what a normal person will do. Um, but in, uh, in some cases, if 
say you don't have as many uh, muscle fibers firing because the nerve that's gone to that area has been disconnected, you'll see that the frequency of the muscle fibers that are working, the frequency of their activation will increase. All right, so you have a fast firing rate, but there's just not as many of them. And so you don't see as many. And so the number of motor unit you know, action potentials is reduced. And that's what we're looking for in our in our situation. Uh, we're looking for uh, what's called like a, a neurogenic um, pattern of recruitment. So neurogenic recruitment, which is there's reduced number of motor unit action potentials with a fast firing rate. Why is this important? Well, because if you have a reduced number and a slow firing rate, that indicates that there is something else going on. And that might mean uh, that could be a myelopathic, so a, a core level problem. Um, that could be a malingering problem. That could be a conversion disorder problem. That could be something like just being you know, pain limited weakness problem. Um, so these two things can kind of help us uh, distinguish between, say, true weakness um, from, you know, um, malingering or, you know, upper motor neuron from lower motor neuron disease. So th those are the two things that, that I kind of think about when I look at these. So we we're talking about, you know, motor unit action potentials. You know, a motor unit is just the number of muscle fibers that are innervated by a single lower motor neuron. And I just want to briefly kind of show this because there's another thing that we look for, which are polyphasic action potentials um, when we look at a, at a EMG. And this kind of clues us into the chronicity of a lesion and whether there's been recovery. And briefly, you know, at the, the top of this picture here, you can see three motor neurons that are providing innervation to multiple muscle fibers. And uh, there's some over, uh, overlap here. Um, you know, it's just not, it's not um, one to one, all right? And then say the two of those uh, motor neurons have been cut. And, um, or sorry, all three have been cut, but only one grows back. That's what we see at E here. And how that grows back is that um, it grows back to the muscle fibers it was innervating before, but then it sprouts and through axon collaterals provides innervation to adjacent muscle fibers. So it actually recovers the function that was lost from those other two nerves being damaged. So if we look at the, the waveform from these two, a normal motor unit action potential is in the top right. When you have axon sprouting, um, axon collateral sprouting and re innervation so signs of recovery, they get bigger and they get more dysmorphic. So you have more positive and negative deflections. And these are called polyphasic action potentials. So when we look at a study and we see polyphasic action potentials or polys on these studies, if those are present, that means that there's been some sort of reinnervation. Now, with a peripheral nerve injury, you can sometimes see um, yeah, uh, recovery through the damaged segment, which would be a different type of polyphasic action potential. But in general, think polyphasic, think chronic, think reinnervation uh, and, and recovery. Um, hopefully, to make it to make it actually useful. Um, and this is a patient that I saw in my clinic and uh, I came in with bilateral hand intrinsic weakness and hand numbness. And um, I'm not going to go through the exam because that that may give it away. Uh, instead, it's going to make it painful and we'll look at these studies and see if we can make it make it make sense. Starting out, we're going to look at the the motor conduction. So we're looking at C maps here. We're not going to look at the waveforms. We're just going to look at the values. Um, and you can see that they've measured the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. When they measured the median nerve, it was just like in the diagram that we did, that we looked at. So they're looking at the abductor pollicis brevis, and they're stimulating at the wrist and the elbow. And the reason for that again is that allows us to determine the velocity and with a motor unit 
uh, with a compound motor action potential. Um, so the left median motor, um, the 7.6, that's the amplitude. And it's greater than five. So we say that's that's normal, right? Why five? Just because that's the reference they get. So greater than five, normal amplitude, which to me says normal axon density. All right. It's not you can't it's not always that way, but I'm thinking that the axons are that are working appropriately. It's not an axonal issue. Then I look at the far right. The conduction velocity is 59.5, greater than the reference value of 50. That tells me that it's not demyelinated in general. All right, so axon density is okay, and then there's not it's not demyelinated. So amplitude is fine, conduction velocity is fine, left median nerve um, motor study is fine. The right side, amplitude is decreased, which may indicate axonal loss but the velocity is normal. So left nerve, the uh, amplitude is normal, but there is a decrease in the velocity when they measure across the elbow. So if they measure from wrist uh, to elbow, uh, or sorry, um, below the elbow to the wrist, it's fine. But when they measure above the elbow to below the elbow, then they see it decreases. So conduction velocity decreases. That might point to a demyelinating lesion at the elbow. And then uh, the last one, the right ulnar nerve. Um, you can see here that compared to the left ulnar nerve, that there is a decrease in the amplitude. All right. So 7.5 for the left, 3.6 for the right. You know, officially it's above three, but when you compare the two, it, it's almost, um, you know, it's it's uh, basically half of the uh, of the uh, contralateral limb, which is significant. So if I had to summarize this, I would say there's a problem with the right median nerve, the left ulnar nerve, and the right ulnar nerve. Um, and then when we look at the snaps at the bottom, the only problem I see is of the left ulnar nerve. So we think back to just that basic decision tree, abnormal snap, abnormal CMAP, and the setting of sensory and motor problems. Um, that tells me that there has got to be a problem that is distal to the, to the <laughs> on the left side. Now, on the right side, there is a motor problem, and uh, but there's no sensory problem on the study. So that clues me into, hey, that might be a pre-ganglionic problem on the right side. Post-ganglionic on the left, pre-ganglionic on the right. Now, when we look at the, um, the electromyogram, there's a few things that stick out. So we had it in our minds that the on the left side, SNAP was abnormal. Um, so it's post-ganglionic issue. And when we looked at the conduction velocity, we saw that it was slowed at the elbow. Now we're looking here and we're looking and we see that there's actually uh, neurogenic changes within the first dorsal, dorsal interosseous. And so uh, increased um, uh, insertional activity, which means it's it's uh, very excitable. Fibrillations and parts of sharp waves that show denervation and reduced recruitment, which means that there are less muscle fibers that are activating. So. Putting this together with uh, nerve conduction, this tells me this is probably a problem with the ulnar nerve at the elbow. Now we look at the right side, and it's not just ulnar nerve uh, uh, innervated muscles, all right? It's not just median. Now we saw ulnar and median problems with the nerve conduction, but we also see a problem with the radial nerve. So what can give you a problem with the radial nerve, the median nerve, um, and the ulnar nerve? without changing your sensory nerve action potentials? Well, it would have to be a root problem, and it would have to be a, a root that is shared between all those muscles. And so in this case, this would be a CA nerve root issue. So this guy actually had a left ulnar neuropathy at the elbow with a demyelinating lesion there um, and got an anterior um, ulnar nerve transposition 
And then on the right side, he had an extruded disc at C171, which is causing right C8 nerve root compression, uh, which it gave the, the picture of um, weakness in hand intrinsics, both ulnar and median innervated, and also <laughs> in the uh, in the pin or the posterior interosseous nerve. And so this is, a, and he ended up getting um, uh, ACDF. So this is uh, kind of a interesting presentation, but it kind of shows in the same individual um, how you can have different lesions along the course of the nerves, and how the electrodiagnostic can be can be useful. Um, that's uh, that's all I got. Thank you.